The brakes are a fundamental part of any car, whether it be the one you use to drive to work or do the school run in, or the high performance Formula One challenges raced by the likes of Lando Norris and Max Verstappen. In your road car, a good braking system is of course essential for safe driving, but in Formula One, the brakes are also a key performance element. It might sound somewhat counterintuitive, but having more effective brakes means that your car will be faster around the lap. Put simply, if you have better brakes than a competitor, you'll be able to brake later before each corner, meaning that you're running at a higher speed for a longer time before the turn, which equals a quicker lap time. Not only that, but braking is one of the most important parts of any F1 driver's skill set because braking sets up the car for every corner of the track and the corners are where you can really gain or lose time to a rival. In a world where the F1 team spent months in the wind tunnel trying to shave off a tenth of a second with aerodynamic gains, the brakes represent a real opportunity to find lap time. Italian firm Brembo supplies braking components to all 10 Formula One teams, but the brakes are not a standardized component. So Brembo works closely with each team to design and produce bespoke parts for each different car on the grid. In simple terms, the brakes on a standard road car work like this. The driver presses down on the brake pedal, which creates force on the master cylinder, which converts that force into hydraulic pressure. The brake fluid then travels down the brake lines to the calipers, where the force activates some pistons which push the brake pads into the brake disc, and that creates friction which slows the car down. So how does that differ from a Formula One car? Well, the fundamental principles are pretty much the same, but as you might expect, there are some big differences in the detail. The first one is a pretty major one, and that is that a Formula One driver uses a different foot to brake. In your road car, you almost certainly use your right foot on the brake pedal, since you're never going to be using the throttle and the brake at the same time. But Formula One drivers don't do that. Instead, they use their right foot exclusively on the throttle pedal and their left foot exclusively on the brake pedal, since there's no clutch pedal in a Formula One car. It means they don't have to waste precious milliseconds moving their foot from pedal to pedal, and that also allows for greater control. Another difference is the travel of the pedal. In a road car, the brake pedal might move by as much as seven to 10 centimeters when you press it down all of the way. But in a Formula One car, from zero to maximum depression, the movement is perhaps only one and a half centimeters. The demands placed on a Formula One brakes are also very, very different to what you find on your average road car they have to be able to stop the 800 kilogram weight of the car from 360 kilometers per hour down to a standstill in just four seconds. Under that load, the drivers and the cars can be pulling up to 6G in force, and the brakes can reach temperatures of up to 12,000 degrees centigrade, which is as hot as molten lava from a volcano. In fact, they run so hot, it's not uncommon to see a car's brakes catch fire during a race, particularly after a pit stop when the car's been sat still for a while. Often the driver can put this out simply by accelerating and using the rush of air to cool them, but if not, it becomes a critical failure and the driver would have to retire the car. The other extreme load is the force with which a Formula One driver presses their foot down on the brake pedal. Unlike your road car, where a gentle movement is enough to slow the car down, the F1 drivers have to stamp on the brakes with a huge amount of force, as much as 140 kilograms, which for some drivers is more than twice their entire body weight. So to cope with these punishing demands over a two hour race distance, Formula One engineers have had to get creative in terms of the materials that they can use. First of all, the brake pedal itself has to be really lightweight, but also super strong to cope with all of that force the driver needs to exert to stop the car. So they're made of Formula One's favorite go-to material, carbon fiber, and each one is made to precisely fit each driver's left foot to ensure that they don't slip off under braking. The brake calipers in a road car are usually made from cast iron, but in Formula One, they're made from an aluminum alloy, very special one and they're machined usually from a single block to achieve that ever-present Formula One requirement of being ultra strong 
are yet very, very lightweight and at the same time, super stiff. In fact, each one is nickel plated for added protection from the intense heat that they go through because they mustn't flex or lose strength under all of that brake pressure. The brake discs in most road cars are usually made from an iron alloy and can weigh about nine kilograms, but this is far too heavy for Formula One. In Formula One, they're made of a carbon composite material, which is strong enough to cope with the scorching 1200 degree heat, but is also a lot lighter and a lot more effective with F1 brake discs weighing in at about 1.3 kilos each. The brake pads are also made of carbon, while the discs themselves are connected to the wheels with a titanium bell in the center of the disc. Of course, none of this comes cheap, and a set of four F1 carbon brake discs will set you back something like 25,000 US dollars. So although the materials are fancier and pricier, the fundamentals of a road car's brakes and the front brakes of a Formula One car are essentially the same. The driver pushes down on the brake pedal, the force is converted to hydraulic pressure by the master cylinder, and that pressure forces the disc and pads together to create friction and slow the cars down. Things are a bit more complex at the rear of a Formula One car. Back there, the wheels can be slowed down by three different sources. Firstly, friction from the brakes, which we've discussed. Secondly, the resistance from the spinning engine or engine braking, and that's pretty much the same as your road car as well. And finally, there's electrical braking, and this comes as a result of harvesting energy from the hybrid system. The MGUK will also drive the rear wheels, but it can also retard or slow down the rear wheels. And this is where a term you might have heard on the team radio comes into play, BBW, or brake by wire. It works like this. When the driver pushes down on the brake pedal, that action sends an electrical signal to the car's ECU, or electrical control unit. And that represents the total rear braking demand at that point in time from the driver. The ECU then works out how to distribute that braking requirement between the three different braking sources. For example, if the MG UK is harvesting at that moment, it's generating electrical energy, the ECU will demand less braking force from the rear brake hydraulic system. If you have an electric or hybrid road car, your vehicle will almost certainly have a similar system to help manage the different braking and energy harvesting requirements. It's important to note that the brake by wire system doesn't actually add pressure to the rear brakes. It either restricts or allows the existing pressure to flow past it. All of the brake pressure is still generated by the driver's foot on the brake pedal, and that's as per the Formula One regulations. The drivers can also adjust the brake bias of the car, and that's how much of the overall braking force is provided by the front wheels compared to the rear wheels. The drivers generally prefer a certain amount of forward bias, so it might have a 55-45 front to rear split, and that's in percentage terms. But this will vary from driver to driver and from race to race, even from session to session, and it can be tweaked in the cockpit by control on the steering wheel. In fact, you might hear drivers doing that during a long Grand Prix as the fuel load changes over the race distance. Here you've got a really good example of Lando Norris making an adjustment to his brake bias while he's actually overtaking another car. So F1 braking systems are super advanced and they're made from space age materials capable of stopping a car from 360 kph to zero in four seconds and operating at temperatures comparable to that of molten lava. And yet in some ways, the braking system on your road car is probably a bit more advanced than the ones Lewis Hamilton and Oscar Piastri and all of the rest use on track each race weekend. We mentioned earlier that the F1 regulations mandate that the braking force must come entirely from the driver. On the road, of course, there are no such stipulations, so road cars have a servo-assisted brake system. These multiply the pressure you apply to the pedal and then onto the master cylinder, meaning that you don't need legs like a weightlifter simply to slow your car down at the traffic lights. And there's another system which is actually banned in Formula One, but it's almost universal on the road, anti-lock brakes or ABS. You'll often see a puff of blue tire smoke from a Formula One car at the entry of a corner when a driver has locked up their wheels by braking too heavily or something some people call under rotating. If you did the same thing in your road car, the ABS sensors would detect the wheels were about to lock and the electronic control unit would process that data and then automatically reduce the braking pressure on that wheel to 
prevent a lockup. It will go through a process of releasing and reapplying braking pressure on the wheel that's about to lock multiple times a second to ensure a rapid braking event without locking up the wheels. On a Formula One car, that's all down to the drivers, and they all know that to succeed in Grand Prix racing, slowing down quickly is just as important as going quickly.